as you minded when Roger was giving the notices there as to as to why a church is like a helicopter. Do you know why that is? Because people are scared of the rotors. <laughs> I'm not wrong, am I? <laughs> Lord, you be with you here again this morning and to to conclude this, uh, this, this mini-series that we've been doing about people who had a meeting with Jesus, who met with our Lord Jesus Christ. We started off just a couple of weeks ago looking at Nathaniel and how when uh, he was persuaded to try and come and meet this person who Philip had met, that when he got there, when Jesus spoke to him and showed him how much he knew him and how, what he could do for him in his life, that Nathaniel there realised he was speaking to the King of Israel the Son of God. Why? Because he tried and he went to meet with Jesus. And then last week we were looking at uh, the the type, the occasion when the the royal official met with Jesus. And how it wasn't enough just to come to be with Jesus. That's not enough. How it wasn't enough even to interact with Jesus. That's not enough. What was needed and what was enough is when he believed in Jesus. Through meeting him and having his life changed, his son healed, he and all his household believed that Jesus was the Son of God. But you've got to believe. It's so easy to come. It's so easy to interact. But it's not enough. You've got to believe in Jesus like the the royal official did. And this week, as we conclude this series, we're going to look at, I'm sure, quite a a, a well-known passage where the Jesus meets the paralysed man, here at the pool of Bethsaida, or Bethesda, if you want to pronounce it in another way around. It's a pool that was on the northeastern corner of the the city of Jerusalem. Um, And it was there that these disabled people were to meet. Some refer to it as the upper pool that referred to in 1 Kings 8. Some think it's the pool that Isaiah mentions in Isaiah 7 about the, uh, the waterman's pool, something it could well be the same one. For many centuries it was lost, it was only actually excavated and found again through archaeologists in the, uh, the late uh, 19, 1900s. No, 1800s, get it right, 19th century, 1800s, that always confuses me. And only in the 1960s that he fully excavated and fi- find the five colonnades or porch- porches that are mentioned there in the scripture. The first thing I noticed when I looked at this passage again, comparing the other thoughts I've been having over the weeks in regards to meeting Jesus, was quite simply this. Nathaniel went to meet with Jesus. The royal official, he went to meet with Jesus. But not this guy. Jesus went to him. Jesus went to him. That's the love that Jesus has. That's the knowledge that Jesus has. Because we're talking about and thinking about meeting with Jesus over these past weeks. And the thought there quite simply is this. Jesus meets us all in different ways. He can do. Sometimes we come to him and hopefully by doing that we believe in him. But other times it's not the case. We're not looking for him. And Jesus will come to us. The paralysed man couldn't get to Jesus. Quite simply because he was paralysed. Jesus knew the situation in which he found himself. And Jesus loved him and took pitch on him. The son of God. The creator God. The king of Israel. The one who will judge the universe in days to come. Went to that individual. Went to that person and met them where they were in their need. And it's the same for us. It's the same for us. Jesus, if he needs to, he will come to us and meet us where we are. We all meet Jesus in different ways. And that's a good thing. And let's take the lesson from that. Let's not try to do it in how someone else experienced, how they've had it done, how they met with Jesus, through this, through that, through that place. We're all individuals, and God knows that. And he will meet us as to how we need to meet with him. Just as Jesus here went to this man, whereas previously others had come to him. Now, where did Jesus meet this man, this paralysed man? He met him, as I've got described here, he met him in a challenge. What do I mean by that? Well, the circumstances, the environments, the difficulties this man found himself in were a challenge. There's no question about that. Let's just think about it. Let's just see what the scripture tells us about how Jesus met him in a challenge. First of all, he wasn't necessarily in a very good place. 
Now it sounds nice, doesn't it, this pool? It's got five porches, five colonnades. It sounds rather nice, doesn't it? Until you realise it's next to this sheep gate. It's a bustling place. Lots going on. Lots of animals and particularly sheep coming through the gates there. The idea was that they would use that gate to bring the animals in to be using the sacrifices for the temple. Now I don't know about you. I don't know how close you've ever got to sheep. They don't smell particularly well, do they? Well, you know, that being a country boy, I go walking and you see these things. And on occasions, they're not the most delightful things, these sheep, are they? And they don't have to run around. They're all mad, aren't they? You go up, up Gwaig Vara sometime and you try to go towards them. They're all off all over the place. What a noise, what a hustle, and what a bustle. And there's a suggestion, in fact, actually, that they used to wash the sheep in the pool. So you're getting in after the sheep have been in. Do you fancy that? Up to, up to a nearby farm, you see him dipping his sheep... I'll have a go at that. It's not a, nice, not a particularly nice place, is it? But it was there that Jesus met him, not in a good, particularly good place, but also he met him there when there was a lot of difficulty, a lot of sadness there. Why? Because a lot of disabled people, a lot of challenged people were there. The scripture clearly tells us that a lot of people were there, the blind, the lame and the paralyzed, just as he was. He wasn't in a good place. But Jesus came to him. And it's sad in our world today, maybe in our meeting here this morning, a lot of people don't find themselves in a good place. It's a phrase that people use these days. Now is it, oh, he's not in a good place, or she's not in a good place. And that's true. Why? Because people have not met with Jesus. They're not in a good place. Things are going wrong. It's not the place where they really want to be. They've taken a wrong turn. They've turned the wrong corner. They've gone the wrong way. And they find themselves not in a good place, a place of a real challenge. But Jesus doesn't ignore that. Jesus will go beyond that and he will still come to you where he finds you. So he found this man not necessarily in a good place. He found this man in his superstition. You see, the idea was that by this pool, because someone had noticed every now and again the waters would bubble a bit. And the thinking was, when it bubbles, the first one in jumps in, gets healed. Now, no one knows where this idea came from, whether it's based on truth or whatever. But my my suspicion is it's pure superstition. Because it was thought by some people that an angel was actually moving the waters, causing this thing to happen. Well, I've checked the scriptures, and you may know that I'm a bit of a a fan of angels. I can't just like researching angels. Certainly, if you've read my book, a bit of a plug there, ladies and gentlemen. I can't find anywhere in the scripture where an angel heals anybody. It's God that heals And yet these people, these poor people, including this man, they're in this superstition to think, if I can get in that pool first, when that water bubbles, I'm going to get myself saved. I mean, the pool was fed by a spring, so quite likely it was just the spring refilling the pool. There was minerals in the pool. Sometimes the reaction of the minerals could cause the bubbling. And maybe someone did get in there, but maybe some kind of psychosomatic healing occurred, and that's where the superstition, the idea came from. But this guy was stuck in his superstition where Jesus met him. Another thought here, if I may, not far from this pool, was the Roman fort of Antonia, the garrison for Jerusalem, where the Romans, of course, at this time, were, were occupying the country. And then a fort then, not very close by to this pool. And the thought there would be that this pool would be what the Romans would call an esclepeon. It's a posh word, isn't it? It's a healing pool. And the Romans believed in many, many gods. And one of the gods they believed in was Esclepios, who was the god of healing. And we just thought this idea that maybe because the Romans were there so close by, that this pool then became that sort of pool. A place of superstition, a place where this so-called God could heal people. And this guy, this gentleman, this man and others were there based in their superstition. How many people today in this world are trapped in their superstition? They think that if I do this, if I do that, if I don't walk under the ladder or all the rest of it, you know, they they based in these superstitions. And it always amazes me, we live in such a technological age. All this week on the BBC, they've been talking about artificial intelligence and what robots can do for us. If you go on the BBC website, you can actually put your job in and it tells you how likely a robot can do your job. Next week, I'm unemployed. I always thought a robot couldn't do my job. 
Because, of course, I'm a surveyor. I, I can't see a robot walking around the house and spotting a bit of damp or the, the roof coming down or the rest of it. But they reckon it could be done with, I don't know, some kind of special camera or something or whatever. But also, of course, now with system build, a lot of these things are built in factory. What they reckon is, it'll have all be set up. You can plug a computer into this new house and it'll tell you, like it tells you in a car, that what's wrong with it. So it looks like I might have a job next week. We live in such a world with so much technology. And yet people, the first, the first thing they do when they pick up their newspapers is they read their horoscopes. It amazes me. We know what's going on, and yet people will still live their life on these sort of superstitions. This is what they base their life on. This is what this guy, unfortunately, was doing himself. And I don't know whether someone here this morning is doing the same. It's all superstition. The Bible tells us that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If you want the truth, you look at Jesus you meet with Jesus, you read his word, because that's where the truth is. Don't find yourself stuck in your superstition, which will do nothing for you. In fact, make things worse, drag you down. So this guy was not in a good place, he was stuck in his superstition. Also, he was stuck, if one might I suggest, in his religion, with the Judaism. He wasn't near the temple, but he was in Jerusalem. And he thought he could maybe get himself healed by being in, in, in the city of God. And it's interesting that when John refers to this, what did he say in verse 1? Sometimes later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, why didn't he say Pentecost? Why didn't he say Passover? Why didn't he identify the feast as tabernacles? Why not? Because it must have had a name. What the writer's saying there is, look, that the Jews had taken these feasts and basically they got so much... Faff around the number, so much ritual, the whole heart of spirit behind the feast had gone. It was no longer God's feast, Passover, or tabernacles. It was the Jewish festival. It was what they wanted it to be. They'd taken out the real spirit and meaning behind what these festivals, what these feasts meant. And so the writer picks up on that and says, look, it was just another Jewish festival. Just another rite that they've got to go through to make themselves feel good and tick a box and say, yes, I have done that. Because that's so, so far how, sadly, the religion that God had given the Jews had fallen away from where it should be. And we get that particularly later on, don't we? There's a man here, he's walking around the temple and he's been paralysed for 38 years. Now, personally, if I saw someone walking around Diva who'd been blind for 40 years, I'd be impressed. What I wouldn't be saying is, oh, you can't walk around there, Bronwyn's not cleaned that bit yet. But look at these guys. He's walking around the temple of God after being paralysed for 38 years. And all they're fussed about is, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be carrying your mat. It just shows the way the whole thing had fallen apart. Come away from what God wanted them to be. They were hung up on their rites, their rituals, their traditions, their regulations. And it wasn't helping this guy because for 38 years he was stuck in this. Now, you know me and numbers in the Bible. I see a number in the Bible. I want to know what that number's doing there. And we've got five colonnades. We've got five porches, if you will. No doubt they were built to uh, help these poor people, keep the hot sun off them, keep the rain away from them. But there's five of them. Why is there five of them? Why? What are the first five books of the Bible called, the Old Testament? They are called the Pentateuch. The first five books of the law, the Torah of the Jews. This guy was sat amongst it. He was amidst it, the law that the Jews had set down, that they'd been given. And still it wasn't helping him. He was still paralysed. He was still lying on his mat. It couldn't help him. Only when he met Jesus could he get help. So his religion had let him down. And the problem again is, and I say it again, in our churches, in many churches, people are hanging on to their religion. That all sorted out, and they're wondering why they're not walking with God. Because it's not good enough. It's not religion you need, it's Jesus that you need. It's not fulfilling rules and regulations and traditions of men. These things are no good. They'll paralyse you. You've got to walk with God by meeting with Jesus and going and walking with him. This guy was stuck there for 38 years in this situation and it wasn't helping him one jot. So he wasn't in a good place. He was in a place of superstition. He was in a place of religion that wasn't going to help him. And also, he was quite clearly paralysed. He was disabled. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I'm not a big fan of that word disabled. I, many years ago, I heard someone on the television use a different phrase. And they said, don't call disabled people disabled. Call them challenged. 
And I actually think that's better. I do. Because I think of the Paralympian, David Weir, and how many medals he's won, or Dame Tanny Gray Thompson, or David Plunkett, the blind home secretary we had for, for many years, or Stevie Wonder, he can write a song that I couldn't write. These guys are more able than me. So I'm not quite sure the word disabled is the way to go. And I prefer, much prefer that word challenged. He was challenged by his disability. He was challenged like others who were there. That's an interesting point here, a little aside if I may. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the, the Creator God, he could have walked into that pool, into that place. There was loads of disabled, challenged people there. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, so we're told. Jesus could have stood there, and in one instance, he could have healed the lot. No problem, couldn't he? Because he's God. So the question is, why didn't Jesus heal all of them? It's an interesting question, isn't it? I think it is. Well, here's a couple of thoughts for you. It wasn't in God's will, in God's time at that point, that those poor people should be healed by Jesus in that way. For whatever reason, God decided and Jesus decided that just on this occasion, this one man would be healed. And that was it. We see why, because God's will is worked out in the ministry and the life of Jesus. But that's God's sovereign will. But the second thing is, by Jesus not healing those people, it seems to me that he was saying that these poor people, these challenged people who are blind, who are paralysed, lame, they still have some value as they are. They don't need to be healed. They still have value. They can still contribute. They're still my people, even in the situation they find themselves. And I think it's an attitude thing there that we can see in the life of Jesus here, that he values those challenged people as we should also in our world today. Jesus valued them in that way. And that's why he didn't feel he needed to heal everybody because he knew that these, these people, these challenged people, could be an example to us, those who don't face these challenges. They'd be an example in what they can achieve and what they can do, particularly if they do so by believing in God. So Jesus came to this man who was challenged by his disability. Now, of course, this means he wasn't having an easy life. It's, it's not easy now, but in those days, it was, I'm sure, a hundred times worse. We're not told that this guy was of a priestly family, but if he was of a priestly family, he would not be allowed to officiate as a priest. If someone was of the family of Aaron, they were disabled, they couldn't be a priest, they couldn't fulfil the job that God had given them to do. All he could do, if he was of that family, was actually uh, wash the wood that was used for the altar sacrifices. That's it. He couldn't do anything else. He certainly couldn't officiate at services, festivals or sacrifices. He couldn't do any of that. And he was stuck there for 38 years. Probably all he could do was beg. He couldn't work. He was paralysed. So most of these poor people ended up begging. He couldn't easily celebrate the feasts of Israel. The Jewish festivals, as it's referred to here. Yes, he could have tried to go if he, if he could, but it would not have been easy for him. It would have been easy for him to get around the temple to see that, that wonderful place where God was residing with his people. He couldn't do it. He had a very, very difficult life. And perhaps that's when he's healed. We see straight away, he goes straight to the temple and wants to walk around because he couldn't do it like that before. He had a difficult life. For 38 years, we're told he was in this situation. Now, brothers and sisters, there's another number for you, 38. Why 38? You've got to look at these things. Well, you go into Deuteronomy chapter 2, and there you read that the Jewish people were actually in the wilderness wandering around for 38 years. From Kardish Barnea is a place until they got to the Zered Valley. Actually, 38 years they were wandering around this wilderness. Now, I know we always think it's 40 years, and it is 40 years in total, but it's 40 years from the actual Exodus until they reach the Promised Land. It's 40 years from the Passover they celebrate in Exodus to the Passover they celebrate in Joshua. But actually, it's 38 years by the time they've done, got the law and celebrated the Passover and done what they've got to do. It's 38 years they're wandering around in the wilderness. Away from God. This guy was exactly the same. 38 years he was stuck in this situation. I know you don't believe it, but 38 years is actually old, is longer than I'm old, my age. I don't look at it, I know, but that's true. <laughs> but it's a long time, 38 years, isn't it? An awful long time. And that guy was stuck in this situation for that amount of time. Just like the children of Israel. In the wilderness. Away from God. But Jesus came to him. And Jesus met with him. He had a meeting, Jesus, in the place where he was. The, the good place that he wasn't, the, the bad place that he was in. His place of superstition. The place of his religion. The place of his challenge caused by his disability. And when Jesus met him in this challenge, he met him with a challenge. 
Didn't he? He met him with a challenge. In verse 6, it says there, Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Well, it seems like a silly question, doesn't it? The man's been paralysed, and Jesus knew this for 38 years, so why would he ask him, does he want to get well? David, do you want to have a brand new British racing green coloured jag? Hmm, let me think about that. Jesus was forcing the man to face up to the change that he had to have in his life. Sometimes we think we want something, but then we get it and then we're not so sure. But Jesus wanted want this fellow to face up to it. He said, do you really want to be healed? Are you prepared to face up to the change in your life, the challenge in your life that meeting with me will bring you? There's no more lying around. There's no more begging. There's no more people making allowances for you. You will be healed and you will walk. This will change your life. This will bring a new challenge into your life. Are you really prepared to accept that? And the same question comes out to us this morning. Jesus says to us all, do you want to be healed? It may well be we need to be healed by being saved and enjoying the salvation that Christ gives. It may well be, Christian friends, you need healing in another way. The question is, are you prepared to face up to that question from Jesus? Do you really want to be healed? Ask yourself that question. Sit down, quietly think about it. We all know we've got things in our lives that need to be healed. And sometimes we just can't be bothered. Or we can't risk facing up to that. Because we know it'll bring a new challenge in our lives. It'll change us. And that is scary. And this man had to face up to that as well. And that's why Jesus clearly and pointedly said, do you want to be healed? And he says the same to us this morning. The man says, sir, does not want to help me. Straight into excuse mode. Straight away. Sir, that doesn't mean Lord, as in God. It just means the customary uh, respectful greeting. Sir, there's no one to help me. In other words, you're just, you're just your man. I'll call you sir. You're a nice man. But you can't help me. You're not God. You're not the one who can heal me. No one else can help me. There's no one to take me and throw me in the pool when the water ripples a little bit. Straight into excuse mode. And that's it, isn't it? Jesus meets with us, wants to change us and challenge us. Oh no, you can't do that. I've not always done it that way. That'll mean moving house. That'll mean changing my job. That'll mean doing something else, being nice to that person. We don't want it, do we? But that's what Jesus has got to do. He's got to change us and challenge us. And we've got to get away from this excuse, go straight into the to excuse mode and face up to it. Jesus told him to get up, take his mat and walk. And that's what the guy did. He finally faced the challenge. I did it. Now, this man has been sat there for 38 years, lie there for 38 years. Jesus could have healed him the day before, or he could have healed him the day after. Which in many ways would have been better. Why? Because those days wouldn't have been a Sabbath. The problem is, he did it on the Sabbath. And we see the difficulties that that causes in, in, a, in a moment. Because we know the Jews have so many rules and regulations about the Sabbath and what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. They had 39 basic rules about what you can't do. 39. Let me have a quick look here. Have I got some notes here? I think I might have. You cannot, I'm sorry, uh, you cannot sow, you cannot thresh, you cannot sift, you cannot knead. You can't wash your wool. No washing machines on on a Sunday. Sorry, Dawn and Rosie, you can't weave. No spinning, no untying, no sewing stitches. You can't extinguish a fire. You can't do any tanning. You can't transport anything from one place to another. In other words, you can't take up your mat and you can't walk. That's the rules and regulations that they had. But Jesus was challenging that. And he said to the guy, you get up, you carry your mat and you walk. The guy could have sat there because it says he's cured straight away. Now, he could have been cured and he could have laid there thinking, well, I can now walk, but it's the Sabbath. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay put until sunset when the Sabbath's over. Then I'll walk. And that's no challenge to me. There's no hassle coming my way because it's no longer the Sabbath. But what did he do? He faced up to the challenge and he got up at that instant and he walked. Because he's prepared to do what Jesus said he had to do. The man met the challenge that Jesus gave him and his life was changed for the better, wasn't it? No longer lying on a mat. I don't know whether that mat was quilted at all, by the way, Rosie, but it was no longer on his mat. But he took it up and he walked. 
Because he met the challenge that Jesus gave. And we're the same. When we meet with Jesus, are we prepared to meet that challenge? Now we know that when Jesus met him in the challenge, he met him with the challenge. And now we're going to see this man meeting the challenge that Jesus gave him. I'm going to be a little bit controversial here now. The guy got up and he walked. Now I've preached this before. And I've always taken that as a symbolism as a man being saved. And going on to walk with Jesus. But is it possible to look at it a slightly different way? And ask the question, was he saved? Did he actually go from this point on and walk with Jesus? It may well be that he was saved. We're not told that he wasn't saved. He actually, in one way, you could actually say that when he knew who Jesus was, he went to the authorities and he witnessed to them and said, look, it's Jesus who helped me to walk, who healed me. He's the one who did this to me. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't it great? And in fact, they also, he quoted Jesus' words. When they said to him, you shouldn't be doing that, carrying your mat, so the Jews said, what did he say? The man who made me, well, said to me, pick up your mat and walk. He quoted Jesus' word as if they had authority. So it could well be, maybe, that he had been saved. But on the other side of it though, just think about it. We're not actually told that he was saved. When Nathaniel comes to Jesus, when we get recorded, he called Jesus the King of Israel, the Son of God. When Nicodemus met with Jesus, later on in, in, in the scripture, John 19, we're told that he was a believer. The disciples, when they saw what Jesus did, turning the water into wine, it says in chapter 2, verse 11, they put their faith in him. The Samaritans who heard him preach, many believed in him. And the royal official last week, when he saw his son healed and realised it was Jesus that did it, he and all his household believed. We're always told that these people, when they meet Jesus, they believe. They come to faith. On this occasion, we're not told that. Also, Jesus has to find the man again. He doesn't go looking for Jesus to see what he should do now, how he can help, maybe follow Jesus. He was wandering around the temple enjoying his new found way of walking. Jesus had to go and find him again and warn him, look, stop sinning, otherwise something worse may befall you. What he meant was, if you don't sin, stop sinning, turn to God truly, believe in me, you will go to an eternity away from God. And that's a lot worse than being stuck on your mat for 38 years. Stop sinning. You see, the thing is here, if it turns out this guy wasn't saved, by meeting Jesus, he had been changed, but he'd been unsettled, he'd been challenged. The first time he meets Jesus, he gets himself healed. After 38 years of lying down, he can now stand up and he can walk. The second time he meets Jesus, Jesus is clearly warning him to stop sinning. Change your life. Come to God. Come to me. So maybe it's the case that that unsettled him. It didn't lead him to salvation. He felt awkward about it. He couldn't deal with it. And so when he went to the authorities, it wasn't so much witnessing as reporting. Hey, look, it was that man called Jesus. I think you better go and sort him out. Because in the verse after he reports the authorities, we then read the authorities start now looking to persecute Jesus. They start now putting a plot into place to kill Jesus. So by him going to see the authorities, it didn't really help. It was all in God's plan, but wonder what was in this man's mind. You see, the point I get across here is, he met with Jesus, but it was unsettling. Because it was challenging. It changed him. I look around the world today, and I see so many people reacting badly against Jesus, reacting badly against God. It's all over the place, in the news, on the media, and our television programmes. People are always making jokes, aren't they, about Jesus and about God. They're always saying, oh, you can't say that. You can't say people are sinners. It's not politically correct. It's not PC. The blasphemy that we see in our world today, it's endemic. It is everywhere. And the aggressive atheism, it's not just the case now that people sit back and think, well, I don't believe in God, and that's it. They're now aggressive about it, fighting against God, fighting against his people. And to me, it just seems to me that maybe they've been unsettled by the challenge of meeting Jesus. And they're kicking against it, like Paul kicked against the gold, so we're told. You know, he'd he'd met Jesus' people, people, he saw their faith, it unsettled him, he tried to kick against it. 
until he met with Jesus on that Damascus road. And I think many, many people in this world today are unsettled by Jesus. And what they've got to realise, and what you've got to realise, if you're unsettled by Jesus, it's because he's the Son of God. It's because he's the one who can save you. It's because he's the one who paid the price for your sin. And that's why you can't feel comfortable about it, because it brings your darkness into the light. And it brings your need for Jesus out into the open, that you've got to be saved. You've got to stop sinning. You've got to walk a different way. You've got to be changed and challenged in your life with Jesus. And I do wonder, exactly the situation we see here. He'd been unsettled, but he turned his back and he walked a different way. You know, John loves this idea of walking with Jesus. You go into his first epistle and he says in his first epistle, you've got to walk in the light. He says in his second epistle, you've got to walk in the truth. Again, he says in the second epistle, verse 6, you've got to walk in obedience to his commands. In 2 John 6, again, he says, you've got to walk in love. Maybe John was thinking of what he was written down in his gospel when this epistle was being written. But what he says so beautifully in the first, his first epistle, chapter 2 and verse 6, he says this. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. The man was changed. We know that because he was healed and he walked. Did he walk with Jesus? I pray to God that he did. Maybe he didn't. But the challenge for us all this morning is, as we meet with Jesus in this place here this morning, as you go out that door, are you walking with Jesus or are you walking away from Jesus? There's no black and white on this. You're either walking with him or walking away from him. Jesus will meet us where we are. In, in a bad place, in our place of superstition, in our religion, in the challenges that, that we meet. But he'll meet us with a challenge, a challenge that we have to ask ourselves if we can meet. And that challenge is not to walk away from him, but it's to stop sinning and to walk with Jesus. When Nathaniel tried Jesus and met with him, he believed in him. When the royal official came to Jesus and he interacted with Jesus, that wasn't enough. But he then believed in Jesus and that was enough. This paralysed man, he met with Jesus. He was challenged. He was changed. The question he has to ask is, did I walk with Jesus or didn't I? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves as we meet with Jesus. Do we walk with him or are we walking away from him? Amen.